Hell Week was designed by a guy named Draper Kaufman. He was tasked with taking the first people into Iwo Jima, mm. knowing that they would all die. Yeah. How do you convince somebody? Because SEALs are in the surf zone, which is already the most stupid, dangerous place to operate. It's terrible. So we want you to go into the surf zone and blow up all the underwater obstacles mm. and do it under fire. Welcome to another episode of Stuttering Your Way to Success with Eric Weir. My special guest today is Tom Shea. T Tom is author of Unbreakable and another book called Three Simple Things. He's a former Navy SEAL where he served for 23 years, is a recipient of a Silver Star and a Bronze Star with Valor. Uh, I, I read his book. I, I, I Rarely do I read a book uh, that I have a hard time just putting it down. I, I think I wrote almost the whole, whole thing through, and I, I wish I'd started it earlier if I knew it enjoyed so much. And I wanted to, to just to uh, screen it, but that didn't happen and, and skim it. Now I'm making notes, I have <laughs> questions, I've underlined things, talked to my wife, and I, I was surprised of just, you know, how the relationship between you and your wife uh, is so critical. And maybe surprising is the right word, I was enlightened, I was encouraged, I, I saw things that all of us who have in relationships can, can glean and learn from and the support you give each other. So, you know, one of the things I, when I was reading I thought was interesting is divorce in America is, you know, I understand now a little over 50%. It's a qualification that everybody has to have now, it seems. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And among SEALs, it's over 70%. It's prolific. Yeah. yeah. And then, but, but you know, and it, the, the thing that, that, I don't want to spoil it. I guess I'm just going to spoil it anyway. But I mean, the, your proposal to me was was like the most amazing thing, you know. And I'm, I'm going to that she said yes. You yeah, mean? yeah. I, mean, like, How I always wonder yes why she that? said yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but I mean, talk to me about her a little bit and about relationships as a seal mm. because you're gone with 220 days a year, mm -hmm. and wow, I'll just just take it from there. What, what, wow. Gosh, it's so a, a long time spending childhood growing up in the SEAL teams through what I call my adult life and then going through the ups and downs of pretty much everything. Uh, that book was originally just an idea right before deployment. So SEALs go on six to eight month long deployments. Mm. And every time you go into combat and you leave your family the night before, it's not relaxing. It's not a joyous oh, moment because you know seals don't go and knock doors and build camps. They they do bad things, mm -hmm. and so the night before, Stacy had the tension was cuttable, and she said, "Hey, I want you to write letter or notes to us in case you die, so I can teach the kids about you." Mm -hmm. That was the genesis of the original book. Mm -hmm. The original, as I wrote it, and since you write, you know, you have to have a theme in your brain. So right, right. One of the themes that was in my brain was uh, Spartan woman. Mm. I wanted to pass on to my kids uh, that without strong women, men suck. They mm. literally do. They're less mm. human mm -hmm. without a strong personality of a woman around them. Mm -hmm. So we, we ended up printing out five copies of Spartan Woman mm -hmm. with no intent that a, anybody in the public read them. And Stacy, when I retired, had it cleared, vetted through the Navy system and through the SEAL you know, chain of command without mm. me knowing. Really? And then wow. we retired, and I got noticed that, you're, hey, your book's up on Amazon. So I've been looking for, Spar <laughs> I'm looking for Spartan Woman going, <laughs> really? there's no book called Spartan Woman. Uh, she goes, no, it's called Unbreakable, Navy SEAL's Way of Life. And I'm like, honey, I do not want to use my trident as a shingle to hang out. <laughs> right, you know? And right. I was one of those guys that hated that. And... Uh, so it was with the intent to pass on lessons to my kids in case I didn't come back. Wow. And what I found in that interesting lessons, but going back to the Stacy, uh, I had gotten the call called divorce mm -hmm. uh, halfway through my career. Mm. And uh, in the teams, if you get a divorce, you get a year off mm. because you're not functional. 
Oh, wow. Because you're dealing with kids, you're sure, dealing with sure, emotions. Sure. And, and so during that year off, I'm like, well, who would marry an active duty Navy SEAL with kids? So I was resolved to, it's never going to happen. Mm-hmm. And I met Stacy and Coronado uh, at the the uh, Starbucks coffee shop. And if you've ever been to Coronado, there's one. <laughs> right. And I had no intent to, you know, other than date and the occasional, nobody's going to commit to me. Uh, met her there. And... Uh, worst meeting you could ever have as a human being <laughs> she was a you know back when everybody's young and pretty she had long hair blonde hair down to her you know right above her belt line and i'm looking at her back and she orders a uh, a large coffee with four shots of espresso and i have the gift of or the non-filtered gab and i'm like oh my gosh you're gonna get hair on your back and i'm like i think i said that out loud <laughs> And she turns around and she's, uh, does that ever work for you as a line? I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, ma'am. And, and then I ordered a, uh, a, uh, a Vente peppermint mocha. Yeah, what's up with that? And she says, oh, you're one of those gay guys here. I'm like, Phew. and we got married nine months later. How about that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's how a great relationship start. Yeah, I remember reading that in the book. It's like, wow, that's a rough start. Yeah, she's oh, pushing back brutal. on you back and forth. I thought that was great. One of the lines that she said when you're when in the book, and it came up multiple times, mm. and the first time, it really, I've got to be honest with you, kind of choked me up. I'm like, I wasn't expecting to see that. But she goes... You know, the, you talk about the importance of being needed, and you know, in your in your team units, you need each other. You need mm-hmm. your functionality, and I understand that. But it was importance about being needed. You needing your wife, and your wife needing you, and yet they're being. I mean, kind of walk through 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 that a minute. What that is, you're giving each other space, but I mean, you're, you're, there's you're you have a need, but you're not needy. I mean, what you know, kind of walk me through that? And it's the same with the team, right? One of the greatest environments that a man could ever have an option to experience is the SEAL teams. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't notice from the outside. From the outside, it's probably a a thump your chest, hoorah, which is one of the sayings in the SEAL teams. But in the SEAL teams, uh, you are impacted by and impact everybody uniquely. Mm -hmm. Uh, The word in the SEAL teams not said very often, but you're deeply loved by them and you deeply love them, not Mm -hmm. at the the SEX level, you know what I mean? But right. there's such intimacy there. And you yeah. need that intimacy <laughs> to grow and prosper during yeah. chaos or, right. or hell, you know? And you're there often. So in the teams, the mission doesn't matter at all. Mm-hmm. Each other matters. So you're always fighting towards each other. Mm-hmm. And my experience with Stacy is I'm always fighting towards her to mm-hmm. get back to her when I was in combat. I'm, I'm only interested in getting home. Right. I say yes or no to missions that if I if I can't solve them, I can't get home. I'm not interested. Right. But once she one words the words that she said that came up later during that deployment was uh, don't fear dying. It makes you weak, and that's I want it. you to fight your way home to us. Yeah. And that's been a beck and call for me ever since. Yeah. And, <laughs> It's hard not to get choked up because uh, it's I real for me. I got choked up like five or six times, and it just the, and I think most people reading this would be choked up, thinking, "I want a relationship like that." You know, don't fear dying. Yeah. You know, fear makes you weak. And I had someone here on here earlier. We're talking about in business or in anything. It's it it applies. You know, fear is. But how do you face overwhelming odds on deployment and? And you read this, the seals are, you know, you, you want to have the, you know, the, the surprise, you want to have overwhelming firepower, you want to have, you know, strategy, unity. Mm. But you go into situations where, you know, the odds may not be that great as far as numerically. So how do you, how do you handle your emotions in times like that? It's probably the opposite of how you're looking at it. It's probably more what you do, but phrased differently. So... In the SEAL teams, every mission that you're given or that you first put on the table, so to speak, is unwinnable. Okay. There's too many nebulous details. It's too chaotic. No funding. Right. As, a, as a SEAL, you have to get all that. You have oh, to get wow. approval. You have to get funding. You have to be training your guys. You have to talk generals and admirals into things that they don't understand. So the first term in the SEAL teams that they teach you is commit before you know anything. Until you're fully 
fully committed and there's no way out, you're never going to solve complex problems. So which is the, the adventure in Hell Week. The only people that make it through Hell Week is you're committed to making it through and then they give you every reason and excuse and experience to quit. Right. And so commit without knowing. The second one is uh, seek your buddies first for the answer. Leader, wow. Leaders in the SEAL teams don't really exist because everybody has 20 years of ex- experience. Right. You have a specialty, I have a specialty. A, a, what I thought the great leaders, seek each other. So the third one is um, listen to each other without judgment. Where nobody understands that. So commit without knowing, seek each other, mm. and listen without judgment. And if you can get through those three, right. every solution is readily available. Because <clears throat> if wow. you're going to quit when it gets bad. It's true. Oh, man. We, all you got to do is stick it out. Well, this yeah. is miserable. Emotions don't come up much in the SEAL teams. Right. For some reason. I have no idea why. You're, or, or you're always the Hulk where the mm-hmm. anger is ready to mm-hmm. just push this button and I can go from zero to 100. Right. But people are always like steady water. Right. We're getting shot at. It's not, a, don't get emotional now. It's a wrong response. Everybody right. calm down. So you spend 20 years holding the Hulk at bay. Right. And then when you turn him on, you can turn him off quickly. Right. And nobody yells in combat. Nobody's yeah. excited. Right. People are actually having fun. And uh, I show boys, my, my two sons, some of the head cam videos. And they're like, mm. what is that? I'm like, that was actual combat mission. We're shooting at people. Mm. Well, it looks like you guys are joking at each other and having fun. This is the, the experience of, like, you know, you've, you've done so many projects. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're angry up front and you're oh. angry at people, nobody's functioning. So Right, right. There are always overwhelming odds and, and things. Always, yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not surprised. But Hell Week, when I was reading, uh, you know, you, you not only were you a, a SEAL, a sniper, but you also you you trained those and prepared others and and, and ran Hell Week. And you know, I've, I've seen shows of, of it. I've talked to my father who went through the Ranger School, mm-hmm. and that you know, and it was you know what he did. But but kind of walk me through to the extent you can. What's that? What's mm-hmm. that like? And is there a characteristic uh, in, in a person? that overcomes their physicality and just allows them to complete that? What, what is that that makes a SEAL u- unique? Well, that's the billion-dollar question that nobody's resolved. So Hell Week was designed in 1936 or seven wow. by a guy named Draper Kaufman hmm. who designed the curriculum. It stayed rather intact since then. Hmm. He was tasked with taking the first people into Iwo Jima, yeah. knowing that they would all die. Yeah. How do you convince somebody? Because SEALs are in the surf zone, which is already the most stupid, dangerous place to operate. Right. Surfers surf there, mm. and kids play there a little mm-hmm. bit, right. but it's, it's terrible. So we want you to go into the surf zone and blow up all the underwater obstacles mm. and do it under fire. And so Draper puts this curriculum together to get rid of people who are going to quit. His whole design of Hell Week is get rid of quitters first, and then you can teach anybody who's not going to quit relatively anything. (coughs) Mm -hmm. And so it's designed to take away sleep from you, Mm -hmm. your ability to function mentally and physically happen in the first day. Mm. Like you go in pretty solid, like... Like 100 push-ups in two minutes, and you can do 20 pull-ups when you go in to Hell Week. And then in the first day, they beat you physically and mentally. Like literally, other than an instructor beating you, they just demoralize you wholesale Mm. to see if that's going to be a reason that you quit. Mm -hmm. Like even, hey, you know, I know your wife's not named Cindy, but hey, Cindy, we're all going to her house tonight. Mm. And seeing if you're going to give up on the process. Mm -hmm. And physically, they put cold water is the biggest physical demoralization in the world. Just sit mm. there. And so the process of taking you through chaotic experiences, mm. and no win exercises. Mm. So you didn't win. Okay, toe the line again. Now you have to make the time the second time. Why already failed? People quit because they can't win. Good, we got rid of the people who have to win to be oh, in the game. Okay. okay. And then the no quit. Uh, it's called surf torture. There's, 
uh, the people who quit during surf torture are ones that like to stay high functioning. So mm -hmm. as I can't function, mm -hmm. like you can't even say your name. Oh, wow. Your, your yeah. eyes track mm -hmm. all over the place. Mm -hmm. And that is the experience of great warrior because if I, if everybody around me on my team already always isn't going to quit, we're already functioning at a different place. Oh, my word. Yeah. And so then I got the beautiful experience to be the only one in history to go into five hell weeks because I was stupid. I wouldn't quit. So they're like, okay, try again. I got a concussion in my first hell week, dislocated my right shoulder in my second hell week. Third hell week, I got pneumonia, had pneumonia, got kicked out of the SEAL program and came back nine months later and made it through class 207 finally in hell week. And you recognize the instructors by this point, right? Oh, everybody just, knew me. Yeah, yeah. Like, it didn't make it easier. You're a legend, right? At that they're point, they're like, yeah. "Oh, here's going to come again. It's going to be. We're going to get you gonna, again, buddy. It's like lining gonna... up to get kicked in the gym, and you're like, "Oh, I know this is going to hurt." <laughs> wow. Um, one of the things I thought what, what, what was interesting, you said you had a couple of words in your vocabulary that you kept uh, for years and used, but you, you took them out of your vocabulary. And you Other than the F word? Yeah. Or, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's his point. That's his point, right? Yeah. <laughs> Belief and hope. Uh, and you, you replace those with different words. So, so tell me about that. Uh, it's clear when I explain it this way. Mm -hmm. um, belief is the absence of knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, people, it may not be apropos from all conversations, people believe in God and have no experience of God. Mm -hmm. If you've had an experience of God, you no longer believe it. Mm -hmm. So belief is the absence of seeking experience and knowledge. Hmm. It's literally the absence of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Great to sell people on belief. Mm -hmm. So hope is the absence of personal responsibility to take action. Hmm. I hope somebody will come help me hmm. get up off the ground. Hmm. So those two things, uh, if, you, if, if you are a believer, mm -hmm you can be sold anything and it may not be true. Mm -hmm. If I would rather experience God mm -hmm. than believe in God. Because mm -hmm. if you tell me things and I believe them, mm -hmm. I'm never going to have an experience of it other than I believe it to be true. And hope in the SEAL teams mm. is horrible. Nobody hope for anything. Get on the wall, put a hole through the wall, and start shooting people. Don't hope the situation is going to change. Like I hope the government comes to save me. They're not going to, going to save you. Right. Or I hope Eric comes and helps me out. What right. are you doing? So those two words get mm. destroyed, I think, through experience. Mm. Another thing you said is a hard mind is breakable, but a malleable mind is unbreakable. Kind of walk me through that. Uh, I think humans are the greatest malleable creatures. An animal has a mindset. It's set in stone. Mm -hmm. uh, humans have the ability to think things and it transform them mm -hmm. and because you can lose a million times every right. project is right. on the always oh. on the tip of failing <laughs> yeah that's right and yeah. if you're hardened to uh, that part of the project has to happen or in combat nothing goes the way you plan it ever <laughs> it yeah. never goes yeah. the way you plan. Right, right. Like even loading up the helos didn't go perfectly, right. you know, and oh, right. they have to land again. Oh, they, they're out of mm -hmm. ammo. And, oh, right. oh. Something. So the brain that keeps resetting, reset, re which I think is the, the greatest mindset, mm -hmm. is have a reset every time there's an issue that you didn't account for, mm -hmm. reset. Right. But don't quit. And you talked about the importance of thoughts and the importance of words, you know, and and... You know, and, you know, I, I was reading, you could tell, like, the humor and the levity and the, the uh, mutual love and admiration among, among the SEAL team members. But you're saying, like, words, words, words matter in general. Mm -hmm. Things that I say matter. Things that I think matter. Perfectly right? true. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So, so how do you, like, recognize, hey, this is, I'm on a bad thought pattern right now. And then, then what kind of skill or exercise do you do to, like, to, to alter that? Uh, I think I got a big, the biggest sense of how words are transformative uh, when I was an instructor. Uh, so I, I checked into SEAL training as an instructor September 9th, 2001. Oh, two days word. before two the, days. the yeah, towers went down. That day, yeah. And 
uh, <clears throat> uh, the, our captain that was in charge of it uh, said, hey, all right, we're at war now. I don't care if anybody graduates. If you wouldn't operate with them, we're going to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. which is a great time to be an instructor. Take your hands off the staff, mm -hmm. let the lions run amok, and we probably did too much damage. We could have had some hands on us. And so during that period of time, uh, I kind of frame it up now as an adult. Uh, and I actually got this from uh, going back and researching great books and history and mm -hmm. how great mm -hmm. men, and mm -hmm. like even in the Bible, there's a oh, yeah. conversation of... Uh, speaking things into existence from Genesis and all the way till sure. the end. Right. And it's actually written words, which is right. The, the language is created by the written word. So in the void, God spoke. In the beginning, right. And whatever you say to somebody with these phrases in it, and it may sound weird, it's a character assault on somebody. If mm. you say somebody is something, mm -hmm. those four being words, am, is, mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. and be, the moment you say those, they're true. Wow. If I say I am no longer in love with Stacy, it's over. If I say I am out, I'm out. If I say to my son, you are a loser, immediately he wow. distinguishes himself as a loser. So in the SEAL training, you're always in the, in the middle of training and hell week and mm -hmm. going through buds mm -hmm. and, and you're all your platoons. The moment you start hearing yourself saying, we are not going to make it, you're like, stop it. Like, hey, buddy, I, I feel bad about something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't say it out loud, bro. Don't mm -hmm. even say it mm -hmm. inside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Usually they beat you up for saying that. Yeah, yeah, right. And they don't let character assaults on each other. Once you, if, oh, wow. if your platoon chief hears you degrade somebody with the, hey, you are a loser, the platoon will take it out on you. So don't do that. And mm -hmm. in the SEAL teams, it became prevalent. Don't character assault another SEAL. Oh, well, that's fantastic. You can, yeah. you know, say, I hate you. That's cool. Right. Yeah, that's that's your right. emotional response. But right. don't put somebody down Mm -hmm. Like they're being who they are, and, and you see it in business everywhere. Yeah, you well, see kids at home <clears throat> getting browbeat by their parents and right. each other, and it's catastrophic. You can see the light turn off in people. Wow, that's so true. Uh, well, one of the things you're doing now, uh, tell me about your your executive coaching. It seemed to be giving back and taking what you've learned about team building and unity and overcoming obstacles. I mean, how do you help business leaders with your knowledge? Well, you know, when you, when you retire later in life, which mm -hmm. most people don't have that being successful and then mm -hmm. they retire, gosh, I'm, is there a transition to be a great sniper in the civilian community? Right. There's gun shooting. And I'm like, right. ah. And I had uh, some great mentors here in town and they asked me, what's unique about the SEAL teams that you could transfer to the business community? Mm -hmm. I said, the SEALs are people-centered. Okay. I'm never going to learn enough about investing because I'm already 20 years behind right. my peers that were doing stock market or, right. or whatever. Right. Uh, never going to be a builder. I could right. be, but I'm already <clears throat> behind. Right. But the unique aspect of the SEAL teams is humans. And so I divided humans, the characteristics of humans, into five areas. Hmm. Health is okay. one, and everybody has a body. Right. Both civilians don't take care of it. So right. I knew I was going to capture that market. Uh, the other one is obviously business. How do you grow? How do you put effort into a business that's not all over the place? And mm -hmm. the SEAL teams are very business oriented, but we don't get paid for the business, but we're really good at the business of being a SEAL. And constant learning. So mm -hmm. wealth, health, wealth, intellectual, and then coming to find out relationship, like we were talking before mm -hmm. we got here. Right. Relationships, every executive, when they have a great relationship at home, mm -hmm. their business booms. Mm -hmm. If they're on a, in a bad one, it's stale. If they can't tolerate their spouse, they can't tolerate people at work. So the wow. fourth one being, yeah. well, I never <laughs> thought I would be in that conversation constantly. And the fifth area is spirituality. Wow. Okay, that's great. So those five areas, I knew I could speak to and deliver product, if you will, that's measurable by the client. At least I thought so. 
yeah, in, in concept, great. and I gave it to the first client, and it was a year-long process. Really? And wow. uh, 2X'd all those areas in his life, even his business. Then it became a referral system where Jim called five of his executive friends, and right. now we've uh, I bought some partners on, and we teach it through a seminar series, which I think is exquisitely better. Right. If somebody wanted to, to, to learn about your coaching, how, how would they find out about it? Uh, well, we started, I, I had to, I had to take coaching, which is the hardest, isn't it the hardest thing in the world? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't want my name to be anywhere. Right, right. And come to find out that, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so the answer is, uh, our website is uh, tomshea.com. Okay. T-H-O-M-S-H-E-A.com. Okay. And I fought that for 10 years. Did you really? So I yeah. went all kinds of names of companies sure. that were high Fandango names, mm-hmm. and nobody could find me. But my name <laughs> is all over the internet. But the, what's your company name this year? I'm like, yeah. oh, so. Mm. And uh, we, and I also uh, like you doing a podcast. Uh, I found out how to find and and recruit people that are really good in the social media space. The 18 and 20 year old kids. Mm have lived it their entire life. Right, right. So I was like, I'm going to hire a great marketing firm. And I've done that maybe 15 times in mm-hmm. 10 years. Mm-hmm. The older generation doesn't know the social media. So I just two months ago hired uh, I, the son of a woman that I'd put through training. Right. And he's tripled our social media. Is that right? And he loves it. And he's like, hey, do it. Do a topic on underwater welding or whatever it is. Right. He goes, that's it's all algorithm based. And I've been fighting doing it the right way for sure, so sure, long, sure, you know. Sure, sure, sure. And it's been a beautiful process to see. That's fantastic. To help other people do that. Yeah, that goes back to your goal. Where you're, you're you're constantly learning. You're trying new Always. things, right? And Always. I'm the hard. I, my head's the hardest head to get through and, <laughs> and chip away at getting an opening into it. And sure, sure. One of the things you, you mentioned also is when you're engaged as a SEAL and you're, you're, you've made that 23-year commitment, you're there, that when you were not in combat, you begin to miss it. And, um, and you know, a lot of people would say, hey, they wouldn't understand that. But when you hear about the camaraderie, the friendships, the, the unity, you understand it. When you retire, is there something that kind of steps in that in those shoes, so to speak, that, hey, this is something I really enjoy doing now? Well, the one thing, unless you've experienced it in a unit like the SEAL teams, it's the only time in life. So combat, my six combat deployments were the only time in life. Everything was simple and clear. Okay. There's no drama. And thank God you don't have your family with you because Mm -hmm. not that it's always drama, but it's complex. Mm -hmm. And you're hyper-focused everybody around you has the same focal point hmm. and communication is very succinct with each other so and then you either killed the guy or he killed you like mm-hmm. that level of clarity is missing mm-hmm. not that i say everybody should it's not shouldn't have that level of clarity mm-hmm. like kill or be killed mm-hmm. uh, but that's what combat is like to seals hmm. people would rather be in a combat environment than go through training because training in the SEAL teams is so nebulous. It's chaotic, and you have your family to worry about. You have money to worry about overseas. It's just one focal point, and everybody gets that same focal point. And I knew that going in. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I knew when we retired, I, ha- I had to replace it with something equal in mm-hmm. those five areas. So mm-hmm. uh, I took on adventure or ultra running, and I'm a big guy. Yeah, they're, running they're, 100 miles when you're 225 pounds already always is not that cool. And then I, uh, I wanted I wanted to keep being around people who challenged my point mm-hmm. of view intellectually. Mm-hmm. And then when you get out of something that you're good at and you get into an area where you suck at everything, mm-hmm. everything's a challenge. Accounting was a challenge. <coughs> Getting, sure. Talking to a lawyer was a challenge. Right, right, right. And uh, so. I still have not popped my head above the surface of the business world because it's always learn something new, think mm-hmm. it's right. Mm-hmm. Social media changes, mm-hmm. podcasting changes. Mm-hmm. The people you meet oh, had no idea about that. So everything intellectually has been a challenge. And uh, I define wealth uh, doing something that I value doing and being compensated somehow for doing it. Mm-hmm. 
monetate, monetization is one way. I like the compensation of being around people that are better than me. Oh, that's fantastic. So sometimes I reduce the fees just because of the upside experience of oh, really? hanging around you know, you or somebody else. And then uh, what's the challenge in relationship? Now you, I have to be a dad. Mm. So I went from a part-time dad in the teams. Now I'm home having to raise my kids. Mm -hmm. And my daughter is now an Apache pilot. And oh, wow. she went to West Point and did royally well. Oh, wow. My middle boy, uh, Garrett, is a junior at Clemson. Mm. Two dad techniques, two different kids. Right. And my youngest uh, chance is Stacy's and, and, and my son. We named him Chance because we were so old. That was our last <laughs> chance to have a baby. <laughs> and uh, so and Chance is a sophomore in high school. And oh, that's fantastic. The, the relational side has been the biggest challenge personally and with clients. Mm. And I can tell you when relationship is on, mm -hmm. everything is on. Mm -hmm. And uh, so always putting difficulty on the table that I don't have a solution for in those four areas. And then mm -hmm. this the spiritual area, I go back and research the origin of spirituality, mm -hmm. the origin of Christianity, the mm -hmm. orig origin of you know God. Mm -hmm. And that's been a blessing to mm -hmm. go back and question the origin of it, because mm -hmm. it's a challenge. So oh, all yeah. SEAL teams are oh, is yeah. a challenge. That's, that's right. That's right. That makes sense. That makes sense. If you could go back and talk to your 20-year-old self, what, what advice would you give yourself today? When I was 20, I was at West Point, and I, it was my first downturn in my life. Mm. So I <clears throat> anticipated it being a certain way, and it wasn't. And... I would have told my younger self, do what you did later, stop quitting. It took me forever to admit that what happened to me at West Point is I quit. On paper, I failed out. Mm. But I got so disillusioned that you've ever been disillusioned, it's hard to function. Right. I would have said, hey, you know, pull your straps back up and get after it. Wow. Wow. You, you mentioned here, and you, you mentioned here uh, when we're talking also the book, but adventure racing. Mm hmm. And I read where there's you know there's there's four people in the race. You know, one's a co-ed. Mm -hmm. You got a special exemption to f f four seals. Uh, you're bigger guys. Everyone else, like you mentioned, smaller. Mm -hmm. They're they're distance racers. You have absolutely no experience, and you've, you, know, you with the water you're fine. But bicycles, what are those? How do I buy them? How do I finance it? How do I? F so many obstacles you can't you came over, and then you show up, and after the first day you're in thirteenth place, right? Which is not where you want to be. And some of the tactics you have. So, how does adventure race? How did doing that with other seals shape both your your being a seal, and then maybe sh shape your business coaching? So, adventure racing is multi venue sport with a start and a stop line separated by five to six hundred miles. <laughs> and I, I was never intrigued with. Uh, like a marathon, right? Where you could go practice the course, you could get better at the course. Everything is known. What combat represented to me, having already seen it twice before I started doing adventure racing, was uh, all the nebulous things that, if you could have trained better or spend more time in a comfortable environment, you would have been better in combat. So when I became an instructor. I'm like, what's out there that would represent this safer than being shot at? And adventure racing was a big thing at the time. Eco right. Challenge was out, and they right. found out that it doesn't monetize. So right. all the business people were like, oh, yeah. we gave you $100,000, yeah. right. and there's no way to get it back. Right. And so uh, where you have to make decisions all the time about other people. How you treat other people was paramount to success. It's not just about performance. It's how you browbeat each other and when you're tired and how a look can condescend somebody. Ooh, so yeah. it was brutal. <laughs> and it was, it, it's yeah. real because you're out with other human beings doing mm -hmm. something that was exciting before you started and mm -hmm. then it's not so much. And I learned uh, the human side of the equation is more important than the performance side. Because okay. you can't get performance somebody out of somebody if they 
if you browbeat the heck out of them, mm. which all leaders tend not to look heavily at how they treat other people to get performance out of them. I was always mean. And mean means cool, but it's not that effective. Do you know what I mean by that? Oh, yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. I'm That's... at the head of the line of anger and mean. Right, 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 right. So it, I've learned that, that it's not helpful. Doesn't get There's you a time for it, but not in a leadership position. Wow, wow. And I may not pronounce this right, but adamantine. Mm-hmm. T- well, walk me through that. Well, so uh, um, the word is something that doesn't exist, but when you have it, it makes you unbreakable. That's the definition of the word. Like, you know, the, the X-Men that got that right. weird substance that had to be combined under heat and pressure, right. and then all of a sudden his bones wouldn't break. So I was, that was my stupidity of not using my name. I, let's come up with a Fandango name. That, <laughs> and nobody can pronounce it and spell it, so yeah. that's why we called our company. And the alliances uh, um, make people unbreakable. This with the two words together. Okay. What are the, <clears throat> what's the cause and effect of making people unbreakable? Wow. You talk a lot about internal dialogue. You know, we talked about external dialogue. If you say things to people and they're demeaning, you don't get good performance. You 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 turn their light, you see their lights turn mm-hmm. off. You know, if you say you're lo- you know, they 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 feel that. But we do that to ourselves. Uh-huh. Oftentimes, we have our own limiting thoughts where we're not even reliant upon somebody else. I talk about it in in in, 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 in senior pie is about the. the what holds us back most in life isn't what somebody else said. It's the lies we believe, and oftentimes these lies we believe are created by ourselves. So tell me about the importance of internal dialogue, and then I want to talk about some exercises you mentioned mm-hmm. that seem to be, you know, wow, this is an interesting way to, to look at, to, over, to begin to overcome and purposely put you yourself in situations where you want to quit in a controlled environment. Mm-hmm. So t- talk to me a little about internal dialogue. Well, <clears throat> imagine that everything to you, you say to yourself is true to you. So since that's actually factual, Mm -hmm. everything you say to yourself is true to you, it's a fact. Be very careful what you say to yourself. And nobody's telling anybody that. When you wake up in the morning, do you say you're fat? Do you say you're healthy? Do you say your wife loves you? Do you say this project's going to work? Or are you questioning it? Not not in particular, but people wake up. And they're like, I don't want to go to work. They wake up, man, today's going to suck. Therefore, it will. That is so true. Oh, it's it's raining good. outside. It's cloudy. <clears throat> right. I'll have that big meeting. I hate when Bill's there. They already, before they arrive, have boxed it into an unwinnable situation. Mm. And what if you were present? to the words that you said to yourself. So right. in the training that I do, is kind of it's re- recode it. Every morning, wake up and say, I am healthy. Mm-hmm. Before you're healthy, which is commit before knowing. Right. I'm healthy. Don't let the mirror tell you anything. Don't let your performance, which is a lag indicator. So That's good. I am healthy. I am one with Stacy, whether we had a fight or not. Whether she's doing something bad, whether I'm doing something bad, I am one with you, which is a relational internal dialogue. Uh, I'm a valued leader, okay. which is a leadership Self-talk discussion. Yeah. If you don't say that to yourself, to us, well, you can't right. hire enough people to tell you that. You know what I mean? Right. And I've found a lot of leaders that have been successful. They're like, man, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Be conscious of what you just said. Wow. Ref- rephrase it because if you say that every day for the next 20 days, it's happen. Uh, the business is going to falter around you or you'll just kind of abdicate the throne. <clears throat> and right. humans, the biggest fear that humans have is that we're powerful beyond measure, which is a spiritual fear mm-hmm. inside of you. He resides, so acknowledge that. Say, I'm powerful beyond measure. Mm-hmm. You can impact five billion people, which is a spiritual conversation. Because if you don't say that, you say life is empty and meaningless. Don't say that either. So those recoding conversations, 
is you have to have them, the internal dialogue that you have to master. If you're not doing it, somebody else is going to tell you who you are, which is catastrophic. And I've noticed that all successful people, they say it's successful before it starts to happen. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No this project's going to work. No doubt. Yeah, never, ne- ne- never in doubt. Um, the internal dialogue, you, you mentioned some exercises. And there, there was more of this, but three kind of stood out to me, and they became increasingly challenging as you went through, and I'm sure that's by design. And I, it, the first one was, you know, wake up, do 10 push-ups, 10 set-ups, 10 squats for seven days. Mm-hmm. I'm like, eh, okay. Next week, double it, right? Mm-hmm. Then 20, 20, 20, and then 30, 30, 30. And you were saying that, you know, at some point in time, you're beginning to like, nobody's watching, why am I doing this? You know, this is crazy, I'm not getting a medal for this, and you want to <laughs> quit. And I thought, well, that may not be so bad. Th- then, then it went to repelling, and I'm like, now you're starting to meddle, right? So we're 100 feet down, I'm like, eh, you know, repelling, and then it's to climb back up the mm-hmm. rope. Okay, well, that's fear of heights. Maybe if you're mm-hmm. something new, you need to have an instructor, find a 5.4 or 5.7 mm-hmm. mountain, you know, things mm-hmm. to look for. And I'm like, okay, I got that. I actually was looking to talk mm-hmm. to my sons. Hey, let's go do some outward bounds. They're like, yeah, let's do it. We're repelling, river raft. Okay, mm-hmm. I got them. You know, they're, they're ready for that. And then the third one was like, a 24-hour walk mm-hmm. without stopping more than 10 minutes. And I thought, well, I never crossed my mind, but kind of walk me through the importance of that and then what that does to somebody as far as learning to manage your internal dialogue. Well, so the the <clears throat> first lesson of the book was keep your promise for to, a, a promise for 21 days. Come to in the SEAL teams, yeah. uh, you can't make a choice on anything unless you've done it for 21 days straight. A new skill, a new weapon. Ah, this weapon's not black. I like black guns. Okay. Don't make a choice until you've operated, done it successfully for 21 days straight. Okay. So taking that into the book and teaching my kids that was honor your word for 21 days, which is the hard, hardest skill set for humans to have. Mm. We don't keep our promises, but we don't know why we don't keep our promises, which I've put into my training. St- 2,500 people have tried to keep a promise for 21 days, and 58 out of 2,500 Come have done it. On. Because in the background, uh, what's going on in the background is far more interesting to talk about. So there's four excuses that every human has that prevents them from being awesome. If you're listening to this, write this down. Okay? The four excuses, and they're weird. Yeah. So the, the first one's believable. So, okay. And these excuses, uh, one of my clients said, hey, subtle, seductive, and believable. Okay. These are the four excuses. The first one is pain. Emotional and physical pain will talk you out of anything. You know, I made a promise. The push-ups hurt. Oh, therefore, I don't have to keep my promise. It hurts. Therefore, I won't. Okay. I'm being yelled at. Therefore, I won't go to work. You know, so emotional pain and physical pain are an excuse we use to not keep a promise. Okay. The second one is, I forgot, which is the weirdest excuse. You get it on business all the time. Right. I sat in on a Cerberus Capital um, uh, board meeting, and this guy copied and pasted something in a $5 billion contract. Oh, we forgot to do due diligence. <laughs> See ya. It's wow. a, well, if, you're, if you can't do that right. So I forgot right. has, has killed people. Right. I forget. I forget things. You made a promise. I forgot to wake up. So mm. that's relevant to every human. Sure. The third one is support. Since my boss doesn't support me doing this, since my kids, my wife doesn't support me, then I won't keep my promise. Mm. The fourth one is, it's a, what we say to ourselves right before it's successful. Mm. This is stupid. Once we say that, I don't have to keep my promise. It's always right before success that people, I, I use the F word, this is effing stupid. Yeah. Every time you say that, it's right before it's going to work. Do we have to do this again today, boss? Do we have to go out to the range again? Do we have to go... Do another podcast. Ah, oh, this is so stupid. It's not working. Wow. If you just go and do what you promised to do, it'll work out. 
So those four excuses that I've seen in the teams and in business prevent everybody <clears throat> from being successful. And they're prevalent everywhere. They are. That is, that is and you a, can hedge against each one. Take aspirin for, or Motrin for pain. Right. Deal with it. Right. But don't stop or don't quit. Right. If you have emotional issues, right. have somebody deal with those too, but right. don't not keep your promise. Get support. Mm -hmm. It's probably better to get support before you commit to something. Mm -hmm. Or if I, hey, hey, honey, I have to go do this thing. What can I do to support you? Because I know I'm, I'm cutting the legs out from under you. So support is the hardest of those to get. Mm -hmm. It's easy to deal with pain and anguish. Mm -hmm. Just get help. Mm -hmm. Get a freaking alarm clock. Mm -hmm. Or pay somebody $50,000 to remind you to, to get there on time. You, you're going to get there on time. Right, right. Uh, and then this is stupid is the most catastrophic excuse mm. that people mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. How many projects have you been on? In the penultimate moment, you're like, oh, dude, I'm done. This is so stupid. I have to do another phone call. I have to go deal with this other thing again. Yeah, do it again, because that's what you're there to do. Correct. And those, <clears throat> those four excuses are, I think, the harbingers of success. If you can wow. get rid of them, you're in. Fantastic. This is some good stuff. And here. then the second one you're talking yeah. about, yeah. Uh, lesson two was fear. Yeah. yeah, fear. You have to encounter fear. If you just, uh, I, to my kids, I'm like, if you just spent your life going towards the thing you, that you're afraid of doing, you'll mm -hmm. be the happiest person in the world. Don't let fear prevent you from doing anything. And in the SEAL teams, they destroy fear as a reaction. And then the 24-hour walk, I probably think I should have not put that in the book. Now we've done 22 uh, of them. We do two <laughs> or three a year. Oh, oh and you, it's a, you lead it. Yeah, so uh, what, what happens during our 24-hour cycle? When you ask yourself, what's the best version of me? You ask it in the first hour. You ask it in the second hour. By the t 4 o'clock in the morning, you resolve that you're not leading your best life, and I'm going to start. So everybody, I have half the people keep coming back to it to resolve what's the best version of myself. What if I just pursued that? Have hedge fund managers come, have two... Uh, um, guys from South Africa that have flown in. So people three pay to do this with you. Yeah. Right. And uh, in 24 hours, you'll resolve all the BS in your life because you, you get tired. Right. And it's just a walk. It's about 2.7 miles an hour, and you stop every hour, and you answer that question. What's uh, stopping you? How long you? Did you stop for? Sometimes they're longer because I give uh, – I used to do it as a 10-minute variant. Mm -hmm. And then the, the guy that had done it five times finally stopped me, and he said, you know why I come to this? To be with people that are trying to answer that question and to hear your answers to it. I'm like, I'm knuckle-dragger. You don't want to hear my answer. He goes, let them talk. Let everybody have a voice. I'm like, oh, man. That means I have to coach. And so now it's a, it's a training coaching event, not like an endurance event. So for clarity, what's the question? that you pondered during the walk? Uh, what prevents you from being the best version of yourself? And people pay f for that. So immediately right up front, I ask it, what's the best version of yourself and what's stopping you? From business to health to relational to spiritual. And, and they come up with an answer. And then 2 o'clock in the morning, there's a new one. And we had four couples that have done it together. And two of them uh, got remarried. Wow. Out of it, like hey, just reinvent each other because uh, we don't like our old selves. And good, start over, reinvent yourself, and move forward. And uh, I had a family of ten people, the parents, and then the eight kids come. Wow! I used to wow. do it for businesses. Yeah, it's probably the best selection process for executive staff. <laughs> so I I had a business bring uh, ten direct reports the CEO and 10 direct reports. He fired four of them. Wow. Yep, nope, that's exactly what, it, that's the person that got covered up uh, and it came out in the middle of the, the night. He goes, I, now I see why all the strife is in the business. And at eight o'clock in the morning, he goes, you're done. 
I'm your like, walk is over. Oh my God. Then, he, then he calls back and says, hey, I fired the other three guys. I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that to a business, but uh, it's a great vetting because you get to see the, the real human being inside. Wow. Wow. Two more questions. Who are your, who, um, and I'm sure it's probably more than one, but who, who are your mentors and what motivates you today? I, I, you know, the, the saying there's, if you show me the five people that you spend most time with, mm-hmm. so I have those five areas, I have a mentor in each, okay. uh, and they revolve over time. Mm-hmm. Uh, a guy named, uh, I won't use his last name, a local pastor here named Dan has been my mm-hmm. spiritual mentor for 10 years, mm-hmm. where we meet once a week to have challenging conversations. Mm-hmm. And then uh, physically, I'll take on a challenge and then go find the best person that represents the top of the field and go train with them for a week. Mountain biking, running, paddling, shooting, whatever the case is. Mm-hmm. So, uh, And then whatever business that I'm pursuing that year, I, I find top in field. And most people are very amiable to mentor. I've never had a no if I would come to you and pitch you with it, you're like, oh, shoot, that's, there's, a, there's a financial upside, too. Heck, yeah, I'll do that, too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, I've never heard a no, which is the greatest wow. aspect of mentorship. Is, yeah. But you have to put something remarkable on the table that <clears throat> isn't, hey, can I just spend time with you? Uh, right. Nobody will pick that up. Hey, I'm trying to climb Everest. Can you help? And Oh, yeah, I'll do that. So I haven't done Everest. It's, that's a five-month engagement. So Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. There's Kilimanjaro, it's a little shorter, but... But you have to go through the desert and the jungle yeah. to get there. Right. Two different catastrophic things. <laughs> correct, yeah, correct. Yeah. <laughs> And what motivates you now? Uh, the words, uh, one more day, motivate me. Mm-hmm. Uh, more so, having spent time in combat, seeing the, the urgency of life, sometimes leave people uh, in business. Man, what if you just had one more day? If you didn't have a whole week, what would you do if, yes, tomorrow's going to be your last day? Uh, and then all the crazy suicides that happen in the SEAL teams and in the military. So Stacy and I live a conversation daily called One More Day. Mm. Nothing specifically motivates me unless I have a goal. But that, that conversation to me is a profound conversation to have. I don't have a year left. I have one more day. Of all the conversations I've had, and I've had lots, I haven't heard anybody suggest a live one more day conversation. Uh, that's, that's, that's very thoughtful. I like that. Yeah. It's an interesting perspective. We can see that. Be one more powerful. day. One more day. It Great. gives you a lot of energy. Like, oh, oh, one yeah. more day. One more day. One more day. Who cares about yesterday? Yeah, no doubt. No <laughs> yeah, doubt. The, yeah, the saying of the SEAL teams, uh, there's no easy day but yesterday, yes. is the negative way of saying that. Yeah. Right, Yeah. right, right. If uh, Imagine you're listening to this and you're 22 years old, you've graduated from college, you're not really sure what to do, you don't particularly have a passion or an interest, mm-hmm. you're just saying, I, you know, I want to feed myself, I want to figure mm-hmm. things out. Any suggestions for somebody about maybe how to, maybe like what steps to take next? Between 20 and 30, make as many mistakes going for it as you can. Pick something and go hard, expecting to fail. You're not going to make it into, probably until you're 40. Don't try to find passion. It comes from within. So there's no external passion out there on the planet. But go for it. You're supposed to make mistakes, which is the premise of the operational SEAL teams, is it's all mistake-driven. <coughs> make them. Mm. Make okay. them in training, but make them. Let's, go, let's right. see how we can screw this up. Right. Learn to do it right, and then push it till it's wrong, which is master-level conversation. But we're telling people the wrong. We're telling the youth the wrong thing. Find something that you're going to enjoy doing. Oh, my God, I've been studying and drinking. I don't know what I enjoy doing, which right. is school. You know. Right. Sure. Don't try to find something that you're passionate about or good at. Get with, go for something that's somewhat meaningful to you. 
mm-hmm. whatever that would be. Could be right. underwater welding. Who, who the hell cares what it right. is? No doubt about Something that. that speaks to you, go for it. And don't ask your parents because they're probably not the greatest informative parts of your life. But go for it and fail. The true character is what am I going to do after that didn't work? <clears throat> Which is what leadership is anyway. Oh, absolutely. That, that's what I the only advice to youth is go for it. So don't don't try to succeed. Don't worry about that. Don't die. Right. You know, start again. Well, I, they can't even get in front of mentors. You're never going to find a mentor until you have something better to give them that they can give you. But don't ask for people for help unless you're you failed a thousand times, and then they'll see you as an advantage. Like, like my daughter goes for it. Mm-hmm. Like I'm going to do something that I can't figure it out. Good, good. I'll, I'll help and she's you do that. Pilot. Yep. Okay. And uh, my middle boy's just beginning to figure that out. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Study, Garrett. You got to mm-hmm. be able to study. I'm not interested. Good. Here, I'm taking the rug out from under you. Now, whatever you pick is on you. Mm-hmm. And now he had. Oh, Okay. And then he starts pursuing it. And right. from the third party perspective, he looks like he's succeeding at it. And he said, Dad, it's so frustrating. I don't know where it's going. But you're in the game. Right. And you'll, the, the game will, will tell its tale over time. Right. You know, the, the question that we stupidly ask people hey, what do you want to do in five years? What do you want to do in five years? Right. Don't ask me that. I don't know what I'm five, five minutes from now. And uh, we, we, we tell kids the wrong thing. Have a plan. They don't have any, any structure for that. Go for something so hard that you know you're going to fail at doing it. Mm. And you'll figure it out. Like you're genetically will figure it out. Don't worry about sleep. Do something that's stressful. Wake up thinking about it. Oh, good, that's how, that's how greatness is. Don't get eight hours of sleep. Oh, that's, that's the wrong thing. <laughs> I don't know what that would be like, yeah. <laughs> that's so true. So true. The first time I went skiing, I had somebody take me <clears throat> to Squaw Valley. Mm. And she was the second. I tried first North Carolina, then I went to California to ski Squaw Valley, and they took me to the top. Mm-hmm. And um, it was not beautiful, but I made it down. But it really, it, 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 uh, you learn how to ski very quickly. Yeah. Exactly. You learn how to slide. <laughs> you slide. Yeah. Uh, rear end and uh, maneuvers and whatever. That's, that's true. That's fantastic. Well, I could literally talk to you about this stuff for hours. I can't remember the last time I've made four pages of, of notes and had just a wonderful time. Thank you. And, um, and if, you, if, you, if, you're, you know, if you haven't re- read the book, uh, Un- Unbreakable, A Navy Seal's Way of Life by Tom Shea. And three simple things I've not read, but I'm gonna. I wish I had known. I would have read it before you came. Good, on. there's more. <laughs> and, uh, and 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 you're telling me that that's that if, if your book you really enjoy I, that. That's one. the uh, the emotional book. The the three simple things was to solve complex problems for um, um, leaders. Right. Which I, it's more didactic than it is uh, emotional. One closing thing on three on three simple things: complex problems, breaking them down. What what do you tell leaders in sixty seconds about about de- dealing with complex problems? Uh, you always have to be on the offense every day, meaning you have to go find new opportunities every day. You always have to be um, dealing with clients every day. You can't abdicate the throne, and then you have to have a five year plan that you look at every day. There's no days off in leadership. What I see, what I saw makes things complex is if there's no sales pipeline that the leader's dealing with every day. So what I initially saw happening in, in leading or teaching this concept was uh, three meetings a day that you have. An offensive meeting, can't last more than an hour. A current client meeting, can't last more than an hour and a strategic meeting that you have to kick the COO out of the office and all lawyers and accountants out of the office because they're the harbinger of death to the future because they're the naysayers. <laughs> and then have an open conversation of, boy, if everything works out, where is it going to be? <clears throat> and those three meetings make the leader 
lethal. Love it. Love it. I know the next book I'm reading. Three uh, simple things. I think it's readable better That's than good. that one. That's good. <laughs> That's good. Well, Tom, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Again, I could talk to you for, for hours about this. I really, really appreciate you coming on today. And thank you for joining us today on Studying Your Way to Success with Eric Weir and my very special guest, Tom Shea. Thank you all.